I just want to begin by saying I believe in preaching. Uh, one of the difficulties that we sometimes have, I think, today is that many of our people have never sat under great preaching. I thank God that I have. And uh, as I did so, uh, uh, um, the preacher was able to open the word in such a way that it gripped me. And I, I, I used to go home thinking, why did I never see that? Uh, and I now realize that what was happening was as if I was encountering God. He came uh, through his word to me. And I want to hold that before you as the aim of preaching, really. They used to say of, um, of uh, Karl Barth that when the bell rang for prayers, he used to run. Because he said that was where God's word was opened and uh, where God was to be found. I thank God for those occasions when I've been present, uh, when people have clearly encountered God through the preaching of the word. Um, through preachers whom I have heard and uh, loved and respected, and sometimes graciously through my own. Um, and if I might just share a word of testimony about that. Um, when people have encountered God through my preaching, I have been the most surprised person in the room. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I so appreciated what David uh, said uh, this morning about the heart, and I'll speak something about that later, about the heart and about feeling. Um, my own testimony has been that uh, that dimension has been something of which I've been conscious under the ministry of others, but, but rarely under my own ministry. And it, it's, I, I can't quite work it out really, but it's as though God um, takes that away from me when I serve as a channel. And I think that might be because I don't want, or he doesn't want me to take any credit for that. Uh, so, so, I speak to you uh, just now as somebody who believes in preaching. Um, uh, God only had one son, and he made him a preacher. Uh, so, uh, those of you who are here who are preachers, I want to encourage you. Uh, those um, who are not preachers, I want to encourage you to consider it. If there are those online, wherever you are, and you've tuned in, and you're thinking about this, I want to encourage you. Because I am convinced that this is uh, something that God uses to encounter people with his presence and power. I'm going to think uh, primarily about expository preaching. It's not the only kind of preaching, but it's the one uh, where I feel most at home. Um, uh, um, I acknowledge uh, other kinds of preaching, but we're thinking about expository preaching and the reasons for that will become clear, I think, in a moment or two. Um, uh, the title uh, for this morning's session uh, springs from a quote of uh, Spurgeon. Uh, somebody once spoke to Spurgeon about defending the Bible, uh, to which he replied, defend the Bible, I would rather defend a roaring lion. Um, by which he meant the Bible can really look after itself, it's strong enough to look after itself. 
uh, and, and, and so what I want us to think, and just to keep that image in our mind, uh, and, and what we're trying to do with our preaching, particularly expository preaching, is open the cage door and let the lion out. Uh, so we want to set the lion free. And I'm convinced that if we, if we enable the lion to escape, as it were, um, the word to, be, to live for people, the word will do its own work. Uh, it, it, God will use that uh, to uh, effect his purposes in the lives of his people. The problem is uh, getting the cage door open. So that's what I want us to think about now. How do we actually do this? Um, uh, the, uh, I borrow an image um, from a um, um, uh, former rector of All Souls Langham Place, uh, John Stott. John Stott. I, I borrow the image from him. He talks about bridge building. I want us to think about bridge building. Uh, you'll forgive me if I uh, move about. Uh, the cameraman will forgive me. Okay. Um, uh, let's, before we get on to bridge building, let's just say, uh, when it comes to the question of uh, what, what am I going to preach on, on Sunday, well, on Methodist plans and all that business, uh, you, you have the lectionary. Uh, some people sit very lightly to the lectionary, some people don't sit on it at all, some people follow it rig rigorously. Uh, some plans, circuit plans, have the lectionary printed on. Uh, we in the circuit to which I now belong, oh, on our plan we have it printed at the bottom of the day, so the dates are all on there, and then the lecture is printed at the bottom, you have to turn it sideways to read it. <laughs> Um, so so that, that sometimes happens. I'm increasingly finding that churches kind of have their own preaching program. So uh, when you, when you uh, plan to preach, they'll tell you, oh, oh, you're fourth in the series and you're preaching on, you know, I don't know, where did Cain get his wife from? Or oh, something like that. <laughs> it's going to be quite a long sermon, that really. <laughs> or a very short one. <laughs> um, so, so, so they'll give you a subject. Or, or, or you'll, you'll get your own. Um, I learned uh, early on uh, never to lose an idea. So I have something called Sermons on the Stocks. And uh, uh, Dr. Sangster used to do this. He had a little book. Uh, which he caught, took in his pocket. He, he called it Sermons on the Stocks. And uh, he, he got a good idea and he jotted it on a page. And uh, the, uh, Dr. Sangster used to say, as only Dr. Sangster could, uh, when he was wondering what to preach on, I would open the book and I would read a page at a time. And um, no, 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 no. And then he'd turn the page and, and something would shout out, Preach me! <laughs> <laughs> he knew it. <laughs> well, it's never quite happened to me like that, actually. <laughs> but, but, but that's the kind of thing. So you've got one or two things on the go, maybe four or five on the go at the same time, and you... Uh, you, you kind of refine them as you go along. And now I, I, I'll just come back, I'll just deal with this now. I find that if I do that, and if I, if I it, you know, the, the, some, the circuit where I am, they, get, they tell me what I'm preaching on in about, you know, two months down the line, next plan. If I, if I know what's coming up, I can have a little page for that. Mm -hmm. and, and I can keep reading the scriptures and they, they kind of germinate. Mm -hmm. And what I find is that I don't have to scratch around looking for illustrations. They kind of find me. If I've got this in my head, it kind of, they kind of pop up. 
So, so let, let's deal with that. So the, the, that's, that's where do I get my ideas from and how do I have a plan or a routine or a lot of this. Now let's talk about bridges. There are two bridges involved here. The first bridge is a really important bridge. Well, they're both important. The first bridge is the bridge between you as a preacher and this book. Now, this book, really important, we all agree about that, this is really important. It's the most important book in the world. But we need to acknowledge that this book was written by people who lived in a different world culture to ours. And the, the older the literature, the more the contrast, greater the contrast. You think about, you know, you think about some of the things that we have nowadays that we take for granted. Absolutely unbelievable for these people. You know, if you'd gone to, I don't know, anybody that Paul encountered and said, that one day people would light a fire which would make water boil, which would generate enough power to move a vehicle along rails, they would have thought, Bleh. It was inconceivable that they ever even imagined people going to the moon. Their world is completely different at that level to our world. I'm going to say this now, and you might not like it, but if you don't, you either go now or don't invite me again. <laughs> what we're about is trying to understand, to grasp, this is the first bridge, we're trying to grasp what is the truth in this. So I want to say, this is, the, this, is the, this is the bit where you like it or you don't. If we're about truth, this cannot mean something for me that it didn't first mean for them. I want to know what was in the mind and heart of the person who wrote it. And I want to know what is in the mind and heart of the people who first read it. What did it mean to them? Because that's what it means. It doesn't mean what I can make it mean. <laughs> Do you understand that? Now that means I cannot take a verse of scripture or a book or a parable or a story or a chapter and lift it out of that context and make it something else. Actually, that's what the, cult, the sects do. They take it out of context 
it was, I think, um, Camel Morgan who used to say, a text without a context is a pretext. So it needs, well, I, I need to understand what the, this means for the person who wrote it and the person who first read it. Now, how do I do that? That is, that is, this, that is the first bridge. How do I do that? Well, I do that by trying to understand what is the culture and the thought forms of their society. And, um, and there's, <laughs> there's lots available, uh, lots of people who've done a lot of hard work to enable me to, to get that. But it does mean that I need to do some hard work to find that out. Hard work, which is easier nowadays than it used to be because we've got Google. Um, which I, I, I'd rather have a book, actually. I'm a book person. I think I want to say something else about that before we lose it. Because these things keep popping up in my head. The danger is that you go to the book and the book writes your sermon. You're looking for those people to help you not to prop you up. So my advice would be, you need to get your structure first. You need to get your passage of scripture. You need to read that through. And you need to say, what is God saying to me now through this? Jot the points down. They might not be in the right order. And there might be too many of them. But jot them down. And then you go to the book so that they can help you fill in the, the missing bits. But you get the structure first. I think that when you, when you do that, if you're really serious about it, when you begin to understand the culture, you'll find that that illuminates. Let me try and give you some examples. In 2 Corinthians 2, I think it is, you can check it out. You've got Paul using a phrase. He talks about the triumphal procession. You know, therefore he leads us in a triumphal procession. Is it some 2 Corinthians 2 something, 16 around about there? Is it? Somebody. 14. 14. Two verses out. <laughs> Can you just read it for us, David? Yeah. But thanks be to God, who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession. Right, that's it. Spread Go on. The aroma ah, yeah. of the knowledge of the Right. 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 So I want to know what was in Paul's mind when he wrote that. What he is doing is taking. An image is using an illustration. He's taken an image of something which would, which would be familiar to all those who first read it. And he's saying that this is a picture of what God's done for us in Christ. So I want to know what was a triumphal procession like? Now I know now. And I could tell you, but I don't think I will, because you, you need to go and do your own homework. 
But I, I can tell you that it does involve people carrying things which were smoking. I don't mean, I mean, <laughs> on fire. And, <laughs> and part of that was that for some people who were in the procession, the aroma meant they were going to die because they were the captives. And for others, cheering on, it meant victory. So you can have one smell meaning two things. Now when I see that, I'm like, oh boy, then all this kind of falls into place. I understand at a deeper level what Paul was saying and what that meant to the people who first read it. What I then have to do as a preacher is to take that and relate it to the people. That's the second bridge, we'll come to that in a minute. Let me give you another example. Uh, letters to the seventh church, here at the beginning of Revelation. Letter to Laodicea. All this about lukewarm and it makes you sick and all that. You're all familiar with that. Do you know, these are rhetorical questions, do you know where Laodicea is? Yes. <laughs> do you know anything about the government in Laodicea? Do you know anything about the water supply? <laughs> Do you know anything about disease? Do you know anything about the water supply getting warm and bacteria and all that business? Now I can see from some of your faces. Um, what going on here? But some of us know about these things because we've done the digging. But I, I won't tell you, I won't tell you this, you go and do it. If you know that, it just adds a whole dimension of meaning to this text. So I'm encouraging you to, to, to undertake this, this kind of research into, into what the text means. Um, I think before we just leave this, I want to say, I want to say something about, about, you know, every word is important. We do believe in the inspiration of scripture, I believe that. And I believe every word. So some, I mean, great words like adoption, and, you know, ransom and all, all, you know. These are really powerful words. What justify? What does that mean? You know, we use these, just the trip off the tongue because we're familiar with the language. But to get, to get inside these words is, is really important. And that does also, I mean, if we, do, does anybody, you know, Rhetorical question. Does anybody here know anything about the adoption system in the Roman Empire? Well, how, how can I understand what Paul meant by ad adoption if I don't understand that? Also, much of the Bible is written in terms of meta... Oh, I keep thinking of things uh, I should have said. <laughs> Please be careful about discerning what kind, of, what kind of language it is. Poetry is one thing. 
prose is another. When Wordsworth wrote about daffodils dancing, I think I know what he meant, but it wasn't a literal thing. <laughs> That's what poetry is like. It's wrong to use one kind of literature and treat it as though it were another. Much of the Bible is written in, in, in terms of metaphor or parable or poetry or understand it for what it is and, and get to grips with the truth that this is designed to convey. Because until you get that, you can't pass it on. I'm looking at time, and I want us to allow time for comment or question at the end. And we're due to finish at 12, huh? Uh, at 1. one. Back, yeah. OK. Um, so, so that's the first bridge. I, as the preacher, am seeking to understand the culture and thought forms of, of the, 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 the era and people involved in the, in, the, in the writing of the book in order to come to an understanding, a clear understanding of what the, te the text actually means. Because it can't mean for me what it didn't mean for them. Right, uh, I've got that. Now the second bridge is between me as a preacher and them as the hearer. Uh, there's a man on the phone down here under the table. Has he gone? Has he gone? I think so. I oh, it's fine. <laughs> uh, so the second bridge between you as a preacher and, and the hearer. The preacher's challenge is, how do, I, how do I distill all this material into manageable chunks <laughs> which are easily digested by the people who are going to hear it? And the golden rule is, do not aim to take everything that you have learnt there, from the first bridge, over the second bridge. Because, well, for a whole variety of reasons, because the sermon will become a lecture, which is terrible, and because the people be, uh, get fed up. What you've got to do is to distill this. And the, I just speak about myself. The way I do that is to write, I don't always do this now because I've been doing it a long time, but what's really important is to write, write at the top of the page Use A4, and on top of the page, the first question is, what is this really about? And sometimes what it can appear to be about is not what it really about. Because the, the language used the, uh, to wrap the message, actually, it, the language is not the message. We need to get inside that. So, so we try and understand what it's really about. And then, and actually, I didn't mind you say this. Uh, what, 
one technique in public speaking and preaching for some people is to say, is it about this? No. Is it about this? No. Or is it about this? You have three points. <laughs> it appears to be about this, but it didn't. No. Or this. No, it's this. Um, if you're dealing with a story, a parable, a, a gospel story, uh, it's really important to arrange the points, I would say, in ascending order. So, you, you know, it was, uh, um, I think Spurgeon used to say, the, te the, the, the test for a good sermon is, does it glorify the saviour and humble the sinner? So, so you need to, <laughs> you need to humble the sinner more and glorify the saviour more the further you get into the message. Don't come with your main shot, first point, because then you go off at, So if we're trying to, if we're trying to uh, get the message across the second bridge to people, and if the first bridge involved understanding that culture, then the second bridge must understand, must involve understanding that culture. Now, I guess that most of you um, are broadly speaking in the same culture that are the people that you will be addressing. Uh, I, think, I think that's a, a very good thing to know your boundaries. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know you guys, but sometimes I've been pulled in. Um, <laughs> sometimes when people, other people can't come. <laughs> <laughs> pulled in for, for things that I didn't feel comfortable with. And, you know, you try and pick out people out and all that. But, you know, there is, a, there is a youth culture, and I'm not in it. You know, but I know people who are, and who can do it really well. Uh, they are not in my culture. Um, you know, one of the golden rules about church growth is about you know, best conveyed within the cultural boundaries. So, so, so I need to understand their, their culture. Well, broadly speaking, we're in the same culture. So let's think about the way of thinking. Well, we're not exclusive of Methodist, but let's talk about Methodist Church. I'll, I'll talk about Methodist Church because I'm a Methodist and, you know, many of you are. It's in a poor way, isn't it? It's in a poor way. In 1951, how long ago is that? How long ago is that? 1951. 73 years. 73 years. In 1951, this is for you as well. <laughs> In 1951, The Festival of Britain was held. Hmm? And to accompany the Festival of Britain, Dr. Sangster preached a series of sermons on what would revival do for Great Britain. Did you know that? Yeah. 
They were, pr they were printed in a book. He, he, he brought out a number of Westminster pamphlets, they called. When he, he kind of summed it up, this is at Westminster Central Hall. When he summed it up, um, he informed the press. The front page of the dailies the following morning was, this in the, in the wake of the Festival of Britain, what revival would do for Great Britain. And the Daily Paper. It seems to us unconceivable that this was happening. You know that I did my, P, my masters on the Welsh Revival in 1904. So you will know that when the revival in, in Wales was at its height, a correspondent for the Western Mail called Austin, he wrote under the pen name Austin, he procured, because he was a sympathetic to the revival, he procured on a daily basis the number of converts the previous night in the various centres of the revival throughout Wales. They were printed in the daily paper the following morning, like we print the football results. I know, because I've seen the paper. That is inconceivable nowadays. In contrast, well, look, let's put it like this. I don't think, I think, this, I, think, I think this is true of all denominations. The probability is that there will be nobody in your congregation that has seen a period of growth in the church. You might have seen individual growth here and there, but broadly speaking, across the denominations, no growth. Rapid decline. You drive through every major city, you find that chapels are now carpet warehouses, second-hand bookstores. You drive through the country lanes there, you find folk living in them. What's happened? What effect has that had on our people? Well, they're good people and all that. But they're fed up. They're, they're dispirited. A lot of our people are dispirited. Um, you know, in, in uh, one of the Paul's letters, he, he says, he keeps saying, therefore we do not lose heart. Well, a lot of our people, we've just lost heart. And and in terms of denominational Christianity, I, I think this is true for all denominations. The grass always does seem greener, I know that, but it does still need cutting. You define that when you get there. <laughs> you know. The result of that is that people have kind of honed in on their own, on their own patch because they feel safer there. That's a kind of cultural view, really. Just tending to lose sight of belonging to the, you know, big people of God. And in terms of, you know, the other thing is, I think that if you sat me in a congregation um, and I just stood up uh, and, and, so, and somebody just stood up and preached and I didn't know him, her, uh, I think I could tell within the first 10 minutes whether they'd ever been in pastoral ministry. Because those who have been in pastoral ministry know that 
that we can look out over a congregation and we know what they don't know about each other. We know, I know. I mean, a great preacher once said to me, Paul, there's a breaking heart in every pew. But we ain't got pews anymore. But we've still got breaking hearts. And, you know, over here, Mrs. Brown, her son's dying of cancer. Over here, Jessie, her husband's just left her for another woman. Over here, Arthur has just been made redundant. Over here, there's a farmer. He, 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 he's, 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 he's fed up, he's trying to make a living. He's on his own most of the time. He's, he's a mental wreck. We need to address people at that level. What does, I'm not talking about their situation. I'm talking about an encounter with God which brings hope which revitalizes, which helps them to believe that they matter, that, that somehow empowers them to face tomorrow. That, that gives them a bit of confidence that they and their loved ones and their situation is held in hands that are bigger than theirs. That's what they need to know. So my job as a... Pre you know, I'm, I, we don't do this nowadays because we don't have pulpit steps and we, you know. But when I used to walk up a pulpit steps, I used to think that that was the most important thing I'd done all week. Because what I was trying to be was a conduit. I haven't got the answers, but I'm trying to be a conduit for what God wants to do for these people. And, and the way he does it, through a poor blog like me, is to try and help them to understand what this book is really about. Um, so let me say two more things is in, in as they will say on a familiar te television program tonight not in any in any particular order I'm trying to address, I'm trying to relate the truth of this book to the real perceived needs of the people. Because I know that this will not only meet their need, but I know that if it does that, when they go to work, or to the school, or to the home, or to the hospital, or whatever they do, to the shops, or whatever, they, will, they will take with them an awareness that the God that they encounter at Gasworth Street Chapel is able to meet their need. And therefore, able to meet the needs of, of the people that they meet. Now, we need to ask ourselves, if that's what we're trying to do, how is that best achieved? Is it best achieved by our Arguing the case, there is a place, I admit this, there is a place 
for what we call apologetics. It's not, it's not apologizing, it is giving a reason for the faith which is in us. There is a place for that. And there's a place for that in the pulpit. But if we stop at that, what we're aiming at is changing a person's mind. You can, you can relate truth to a person um, and leave them just the same, actually. In one of his books, um, I think Contemporary Christianity, John Stott speaks of the way in which he, um, he encountered two, I think, two Oxford University students who were skeptical about Christianity. Um, and he sat down with them for, uh, I know, quite a long time, and he argued the truth of the gospel narrative, at the end of which, one of them looked at him and said, but what difference does it make to me? So we need to realize that if we're going to, if that truth is going to impact a person's life, it needs to be a, a deeper level than the intellect. Um, it's about the heart. We've had it this morning. Um, my God, I know West is wrong, and my God, I know I feel the mine. Uh, they said of the early Methodists, including Wesley, what was distinctive was that ours was a religion of the heart. Uh, we need to aim not just at the mind, but at the heart. And that's how we'll get to the will. You'll not get to the will without the heart. So, so um, we need to take the heart seriously. Now, how do you do that? Well, you can do that with impassioned pleas and all that. I find it easiest uh, to do it with a story. You need to, you need a good illustration. And my advice to you would be, um, let the story do the work. There is nothing, well, there are some things worse, <laughs> slightly, but it's really bad if you get a preacher who has a really good illustration and then he tries to unpack it, let the story do the work. Um, and finish. Finish. So, so, So the last thing is this. Um, I think our aim is, in a nutshell, I think it is having, having gleaned the truth of the Bible. What we will find is that that truth, when we push it over the second bridge, what it will do is it will comfort the disturbed and it will disturb the comfortable. And that's what we're about. And, um, and it needs to be that way around. We need to comfort the disturbed and we need to disturb the comfortable. And all the while, what we keep paramount 
is that question, what is this really about?